Okay, so I'm going to go through this. This is this is going to be sort of a technical talk. I think the, the title gives it away. Um, I, I sent like a description over to the go-to folks, and that seems to have ended up in the program as the title. The title was like four lines long, but at least you know exactly what you're going to get. So yeah, I'm going to go through this. It's going to be you know a fairly low level, and the, uh, you're just looking at some practical tips and the the tooling that's available on this stuff. Uh, there is a demo. It wasn't working about 20 minutes ago. It was working yesterday. I'm a professional, but it wasn't working about 20 minutes ago. Uh, I think the software got updated, but we'll try it. And if not, I'll explain what, what, you know, what you're meant to see and what's meant to happen. Um, please do ask questions as we go along, because it's, it's only a fairly small group, and I, I'm not necessarily got 50 minutes worth of, of content. So let's, uh, let's open the discussion up. So we'll start off with a box. Um, this, so let's say this is a container image, right? This is a, a container image that, that you've built or that you found on the internet and you want to run it. So what, you know, what could possibly go wrong? What's, what's not to trust about this opaque blob of software? Well, for a start, you know, there's the computer that it's running on. Um, the, the zero trust buzzword gets bandied around an awful lot. I'm going to try not to say it today. Uh, but obviously, you know, there could be threats on the network. You know, it, this thing needs to be protected from its, its neighbors on the network, its neighbors in terms of other VMs that are on the same host, other containers in the same cluster. Even if they don't directly attack it, they can be noisy and whatever else. This is, this is you know, sort of well studied. Um, it's still a huge open area, but I'm, I'm not going to go into it. That's kind of not the point uh, of this talk, because you'd be talking about TPMs and BIOSes and secure boot and, you know, a workload attestation, all that kind of stuff. But within our container, there you know, are going to be several things. So shown here in blue is probably our app, right? So let's say we're, we're building this container, or we've, or we've downloaded it. You know, maybe this is WordPress. Uh, so the blue blob is the, the lovely PHP of WordPress. So that's going to obviously be in our container, but it's also going to contain other things. You know, we, these, so these orange uh, packages are the other packages you might find in a container, just like you might find on a, um, you know, like a, a manually installed Linux host. So we might have a C library, we might have libssl, we might have some CA certs, more on which later, and of course we might have a Java runtime or we might have a PHP runtime or, or something like that. So uh, zero trust, okay, maybe I'll say it once. Zero trust says to trust nothing, but that's obviously not quite true, right? A zero trust network isn't about trusting nothing, it's about sort of assuming nothing. It's about not trusting things just based on where they are in the network. It's, it's about actually asking for an identity for a JWT or a certificate or something. Uh, and we're going to look at the sort of compute side of things today, and it's, it's kind of the same thing. We have to trust some stuff. Ideally, we, we want to trust everything in this container because that's what we're going to run, right? So, but the first step to that is to know what's in it, and then we can start looking at, at where that comes from and how it's built and what we should trust and what we shouldn't trust. So the, the first step is to understand what's in this container. So the, the application, the, I mean, these things are all the same, really. I've colored them different colors, but they're all just you know, blobs of, of code in the container. But uh, you know, our application or the application, this WordPress that we've downloaded, is actually probably going to be a modern, complicated piece of software. It's going to have a bunch of dependencies. So if this is written in PHP, you know, I actually don't really, I really don't know enough about PHP. These are all the like pair packages or something. If this is written in Go, these are all the Go dependencies, right? Um, that are going to make up this app because nobody writes anything from scratch these days. And these orange things, these other packages, you know, you might just see libssl in there, but that thing's probably, you know, going to have dependencies in libssl's case, not too many, um, but it's still used as sort of crypt crypto primitives. But if your container image just got um, a shell in it that's built from a whole load of packages like readline and whatever. So everything in this, you know, in this container, even if we say, oh, well, this is the Nginx container, it's not just Nginx, it's also got a libc and some other stuff, uh, and maybe a shell and a whole load more stuff, which we'll come on to. You know, even that's not enough to reason about. We have to look at all the dependency trees of all of these things. And you know, even if, if this, so the orange things is say an OS package, this package has other packages as dependencies. You know, I, I apt install, say I actually install Nginx locally, right? It's going to pull in a bunch of dependent packages. We've always seen this. You know, you type apt install one thing. It's like, do you want to install these 50 other things? Those 50 other things are pieces of software which themselves are going to have dependencies in their, their language. C libraries that are linked into them, Go dependencies, Java dependencies, whatever. So there's a lot of stuff is the point, right? And it's not trivial to work out what all those things are. 
especially because depending on the language that these things are written in, you know, dependencies are uh, grabbed in different ways and they're, they're built into the final package in different ways. And of course, if it's a compiled language, it might actually not be obvious. You know, when you've just got the end result, it might not be easy to just open the lid and work out what's in there. With, with Python, it is because you just see all the code, right? Uh, with a, like a C binary, it's not necessarily that simple. So why do we care about this? Well, this is a lot, of, I said, this is a lot of software and we need to understand what's running in order to be able to, to work out if we can trust it. There's, there's lots of attacks against this, actually. I mean, supply chain attacks have been a huge thing. They've come, I think, to fruition, like people are talking about them a lot recently. It goes all the way back to RSA. Uh, I'm way before, obviously, but like RSA was a big, Stuxnet was a big newsworthy thing, I would say. Um, but you know, much more recently, people have been talking about this a lot. So I won't go through all of them. You can you can find lots of resources on the internet. But you know the red one is a bad package, uh, and the obvious things are things like you know typo squatting, right? So I'm doing some node. Obviously, I want Lodash because I'm not going to write all of that stuff by hand. You know, but I accidentally mistype yarn add modash. People will squat malicious packages on similar names that you might typo. So I type. Uh, you know, yarn add modash, and I don't get an error because there is a package called modash, but it's it's a malicious one because somebody's typo squatting. Dependency confusion was another cool one that came up recently. Um, cool in the you know you got to hand it to them kind of sense. Obviously not not great for us. Uh, which is where a lot of these package managers will search the global public package repository before your internal one. So if you're trying to add a dependency on one of your internal packages that's in your you know, artifactory or whatever, your local repo, it'll actually go search the public one first. And you know, if you're installing, trying to install Acme Corp dash utils, you might not expect that to exist on the internet, so normally it would fall back to your local package repo, except people squat those as well. They, could, they can brute force or, or guess the names. So, uh, so that yeah, that's called dependency confusion. That's been another good one recently. And as I say, there's more. This isn't really a sort of security talk. I won't go into all of them. So what can we do about this? All right, we, people talk a lot about sort of signing container images. Maybe that's why you're here. Maybe you want to learn how to, you know, sort of sign your container images. But what does that mean? Like signing this, putting a tick on it, doesn't make the software good. Right, what am I certifying? Like I'm certifying that the big, the big tarball of stuff that we're going to end up running is the same as the one that pass, uh, passes across my desk. So I can do all of these checks at, you know, at runtime. I can have my Kubernetes admission controllers and whatever that will, sure, check the signature and verify that what I'm running is exactly the same as what I signed. But if I'm just signing what came across my desk, then that's not really telling me, it's telling me it's not been tampered afterwards, but it's not telling me that what I built was good. And my argument to you is that what I built probably isn't all that good because it's super complicated. The other thing I can do, and the other thing that's a big topic recently is I can, this is meant to be an S-bomb. I can make an S-bomb, a software bill of materials, so I can actually list what's in all of this stuff. Now that's, that is super useful, and that's something that we'll, that we'll look at. Um, that helps me reason about what I've built. Uh, I might want to go read that S bomb and sort of you know reason about whether all those things are necessary, and it helps me reason about what I'm running. So if I build, you know, this this thing with all of these packages in, and I make that manifest of what's in it, then I can check that when the thing runs. It might be a month later. It might be six months later. You know, there might have been CVEs discovered in some of these things since, and I can then, you know, take. I know exactly what's in here, especially if it's a compiled language. As I say, I can't necessarily do that at runtime, um, but at the build stage, I know everything that's coming in. I can see what's in here. I can make a list of it. I can sign that, and then later, when we come to run this thing, we'll use the signature to make sure that the, the list hasn't been tampered. And then we can look through the list and check that there's, you know, there's, uh, we haven't sort of blocked, block listed any of those packages. It helps, but again, it's not, you know, everything. Uh, again, don't, I mean, so the signature will let us later attest that the, the uh, S-bomb hasn't been tampered with. But again, don't just sign S-bombs that come across your desk, right, as the sort of staff engineer or security guy or whatever. Um, because that, that doesn't tell us anything. You've got to check it. You know, your CI should be making this thing, and you, you need to do a lot of work to make sure your CI pipeline is secure and repeatable and whatever so that we can actually trust the S-bomb when we, when we come to sign it. But this is, this is obviously a great first step in, in trying to address a lot of these problems. One of the reasons that it's hard 
to sort of reason about what's going on in these containers is because of the way we normally build them. So the way we normally build them is that they, we build up these layers. If you ever said, you know, Docker runs something and you'll see fetching, 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 you get this list of, of several things that it'll download. These are all the different layers. It's essentially tarballs stacked on top of tarballs. And that's because of the way that most containers are made. They're made with a Docker file, right? And the Docker file, each line in that Docker file is another command that does something that makes another layer. So each, each line of the Docker file that says, you know, add this, actually makes another layer. It makes a tarball with just that thing in, and then the tarballs are extracted on top of each other. I mean, basically, it's basically that simple. And a Docker file is, so you end up, because the Docker file is this sort of multi-line thing, you end up with these multiple layers. And the Docker file is also imperative, right? Any, each, any of those layers could be a run command, where you can run arbitrary bash script, or even if it doesn't look like it, even if it runs you know, yum install or RPM install, all those packages, those package formats, allow for hook scripts, pre-install, post-install hook scripts. So again, they can be arbitrary pieces of script in there, and they, you know, they could contain a mistake, they could do something, you know, unwittingly dangerous, or they could have malicious code put in the mind actor, right? This is obviously, we've seen this a load of times, this is a very common attack, is you know, somebody manages to get commit privileges to you know, an open source package, and they'll put malicious code in there, they'll put a backdoor in, they'll put a shell in, they'll put, often they just put a crypto miner in, right? They'll just fish somebody's email, and they'll get access to, I think it happened to React or something, didn't it? Like a massive project that everybody was downloading, and some script kitty just put a crypto miner in there, right? And the next day, everybody downloaded the latest version of, of React, and like every server across the world just like mined this kid Monero for like five minutes until somebody realized. But it was a lot of parallel compute. I think he made quite a lot of money. Um, but obviously, there's much more subtle, malicious things you can, you can do with a lot of these packages. Uh, and these pre and post install hooks are, are definitely a vector. So anyway, all I'm saying is you know, all of these things, arbitrary scripting languages, they could do anything. And, the, and they're Turing complete. So it is the halting problem. We cannot know. We can't statically analyze it. We can't know whether these things are going to do malicious things or not. Uh, they are all genuine attack vectors. So it's, it's best to just, to just not run them. The other thing I'm kind of showing here is that we can overwrite things. So I've got a base image here, you know, but maybe my company wants us to use Red Hat Enterprise, uh, you know, because it's it's secure and it's stable and it's it's very mature and it's you know heavily curated by Red Hat. But of course, that, that means that everything in it's out of, like a long way out of date. So I install some other package in that first layer, and this package wants some post quantum crypto cipher because of course it does. So that thing pulls in as a dependency. A much new, my base image, say, has libssl in it, but this fancy package pulls in a much newer version of libssl as a dependency that's got a bunch of these newer ciphers in. So I've now kind of, without realizing it, I've installed a newer version of libssl over the top. Nobody has a quantum computer yet, uh, but what new version of libssls probably do have is a bunch of ODE because they're brand new, right? Whereas the, the old Red Hat version, although it's old, is, is probably going to be pretty secure. So we, this can happen without us even realizing it. And that's another artifact of the fact that these things are built up in layers. So I think it's better to think about these things horizontally rather than vertically, right? What packages do we want in this container image at the end? And can we build it in a declarative way? Can I declare what the end artifact should look like rather than talking about the steps that I want to take to get there? And even better than that, and hold this thought, we can use a package format that doesn't actually allow these arbitrary hook scripts, right? So that if I can declare a set of packages in this thing, I know exactly what it's going to look like because none of them can go and do Turing complete things that I can never that I can never reason about. So, uh, quick poll: how how do you all build your container images? Like, if you've got a piece of software in your company, if you're trying to build it into, into an image to run in you know, Kubernetes or um, uh, ECS or anything like that. How do we build them? Anybody use Docker files? Cool, right, that's, that's like most people, right? So Docker files are the common one. Um, you've got the newer, the newer build engines, you know, build kit and build X. These are, you know, implementation details. Uh, they can do really neat stuff, like the automatic QMU emulation, super cool. Um, and they, uh, they run in parallel, they, they have pretty, you know, colorful terminal output, they, they do good things, but they're in implementation detail. Okay, so Dockerfile is, is pretty common. Does anybody use KO, JIB, any of these things? Daniel, okay, a couple of people. Um, so these are language-specific container image builders. Um, uh, KO is for Go, JIB is for Java, 
Uh, and so they will take a piece of source code and they'll go straight from source code to container image in one step. You don't have to like compile it and then have a Docker file that pulls the artifact in and, and stuff. But they, so they're, they're neat, but they're language specific. Um, We've then got Canico. I, I, I don't think anybody's going to use any of these other things. So Canico is, this was just a list of like everything I could think of, everything I've had to work with. Um, Canico is like a Docker in Docker builder, so it's useful for building stuff inside a Kubernetes cluster without having to do like a, do a Docker daemon mount. Um, so there's a bit of security there, a bit of runtime security. It's what OpenShift uses, basically. Um, build packs were this kind of old idea. Nobody, I don't think anybody really uses them. They were trying to replicate the Heroku experience. Obviously, anybody who's used Heroku knows how nice that was, how nice it was to, to build software. Um, build packs tried to do the same thing and get you a container image. Um, they kind of came onto the tech radar, and then, they, and then they, I got excited, and they fell off again. Um, Bazel can build container images. Anybody who's done any like advanced C++ or Java or something has had to wrestle with Bazel. Um, even the sort of ex-Googlers I talk to don't like it. It is great when it works, and it does have a bunch of really nice properties, but it's such a pain, and it's so hard to support. And the last one is the tool I'm going to talk about today from a startup called uh, ChainGuard, which is AppCo. OK, so say we're using, say we're using a Docker file. Like, what are some of the problems? I mean, what, so firstly, what is your base image? Right? I'm probably going to say from Node, or you know, worse, from PHP, from WordPress. These are meant to be build time images. I mean, spoiler alert, I'm going to talk about multi-stage builds, which I guess if you're in this talk, you, you probably do know about. But just, yeah, stop to think that these are you know, build time images. They contain a whole bunch of software. They contain compilers and runtimes and debugging tools and all of that stuff. Um, uh, dev versions of libraries with all the headers in. They're meant to build your software, package your software. They're not meant to be runtime images. So they're physically big. They take a long time to download. They take a, a lot of time to cache. And they're full of software. And that software, you know, I've, we've talked about what we probably don't know what it is. But you know, the more software, even if you do know what it is, the more software you've got, the more likely you are to have a bunch of CVEs in it. So we move on to multi-stage builds, you know, specialized runtime base images. So we can do that, you know, multi-part Docker build. So you know, from Golang, you know, load all the dependencies, compile, and then from scratch copy the thing in. But which base image do we use? There's, there is Scratch. Um, Scratch is completely empty. That causes its own problems with actually you know, getting your software to, to run and have the, the stuff that it needs. So we're more likely to use Distroless. But actually, even Distroless is a little bit complicated. You know, there's more than one flavor of Distroless. If you go and list the, the registry, you get, weirdly enough, in, in this order, um, it says base, static. Uh, yeah, CC. So you can guess these are like, okay, and then there's one for C and one for Python 3 and whatever. If you dig into it, like, I think they've done that thing where the thing called default is not actually the default. So static is for uh, statically compiled languages, like, say, Go, except Go doesn't normally statically link and you can't actually normally get away with static. Um, base. Might sound like it's the base, but it's actually static plus some stuff. So base actually has more than static, uh, and includes. I've got it written down. I think it includes. Um, it's not written down on this slide. We'll come back to it. But base includes more stuff uh, than static, and is actually what you often need for even something like a Go program, which you think is like a self-contained static thing. Oh no, sorry. Yes, base includes like glibc, libssl, openssl. Like there's quite a lot of stuff in. Base. Uh, there's the CC image for C++. This adds like uh, libgcc. This is actually what you need for, for Rust, right? So this is just, and what I'm saying is this is it's just not obvious which one to choose, which one has, if you're trying to reduce your size, reduce your attack surface, which one of these things is going to have the least stuff in it. Um, static is two and a half meg, right? Despite being sort of allegedly empty. Uh, the Java 17 one's 232 meg as of yesterday. Uh, and the Node.js 21 contains over 5,300 files. So, again, like, do you know which one of these to pick? Do you know what's in it? Do you trust it? Because these, although they're meant to be minimal, they're still fairly broad brushstrokes that like, oh, well, the CC one's the one you need for C++ code and Rust code. And the static one, you know, is the one you need for Go if you can compile it in the right way. But it's actually, you know, got... It's not got enough in it, so you probably want base, which isn't really the base, and it's got more stuff in it than you think. So 
still difficult to do. And these things do not come. We've talked about, you know, making S bombs for our own, for our container images. These things do not come with S bombs. So there's a lot of stuff in them. I found out by like downloading the tables and, extract, and abstracting them. There's no easy way to know that. You know, I had to do that manually, and there's no way to start doing sort of runtime cluster runtime enforcement. Uh, this is just me complaining about distros a bit more. I think I've probably said all of that stuff. So enter the first tool we're going to look at, which is APCO, APKO, which is sort of a, a custom distro list, but it's a builder for custom distro lists. So first of all, APK, as in the package manager, APK is actually decent, right? APK, I will, I will tell you, is actually good. You probably hate it, but it's probably good. It does things like it, does, it has no hook scripts. So you can't, uh, AP, APK package cannot run that arbitrary bash and do things that you don't understand. It does ahead of time constraint satisfaction. So if you try to add, uh, install an APK package or packages into a system, it will go and have a look and make sure it's not going to overwrite any of those files. Because there's no arbitrary fucking about with these Turing complete scripts, it can go and do that. So it does constraint satisfaction and nothing's going to clash. Um, it, cannot move the system into a broken state because of that. Everything can be a transaction because you know what's going to happen. You know, how many times have you done a, you know, apt disk upgrade and it's just blown up because some post install scripts had an error because it made the wrong assumptions. So APK as a package manager, I will tell you, is, is actually good. Alpine is a distro. Alpine is the primary user of APK packages and probably where you've come across it. Uh, so Alpine has their own repo of packages. So this is just a nuance that that you might not have thought about, right? Including their their very base layout. Um, so like, so RPM is a package manager. And if I say RPM, you might think Red Hat, but SUSE uses RPMs as well. So Red Hat and SUSE are distros. They have their own repos of packages. So they build different software in different ways, but they just build them into RPMs and use RPM. So Alpine is a distro that has its own set of packages, but they happen to be APK packages. Um, if you think you hate APK. You probably actually hate Alpine. You've probably just had bad days with Alpine. And if you think you hate Alpine, it's actually because you probably hate BusyBox. So APK, I thought I hated APK for the longest time because I just remember it was always always turned up on the bad on the bad days. It's probably because you hate BusyBox or uh, or Alpine. But APK as a package manager as a package format has a bunch of these good properties. So APKO builds these custom distro list containers from APKs. So rather than taking distro list, because as I said, there's a few flavors, and they've all probably got a little bit more in than you think, we can go specify exactly which packages we want in our, in our base image. So we've got, a, you know, we've got a repo of packages that are very small, very thinly sliced, and we can bring individual little things into our base images. And we build them with um, out of these APKs, which of course makes it deterministic and declarative because of all of the properties of APK that I've talked about. So what's Wolfie? As I said, a package manager is not a distro. Wolfie is a set of Alpine APKs. So if we want to build you know, these custom distros, these very small base images, you know, we could build them from Red Hat's RPMs. We could build them from Alpine's APKs. But Wolfie is another distro, another set of APKs. Uh, the Wolfie packages are all built by, by ChainGuard. Um, because they're all built by ChainGuard, they all have S-bombs and they all have signatures. So we know, if we come back to the, you know, this picture, if each of these is a, uh, a package in the, you know, I've got the base layout in my container image and I've got uh, libssl and I've got libc, there's an S-bomb on each of those to say exactly what it was built from and when, and it's all signed and it's all attested. So now I do not, even with these things that end up as a binary blob, right, libc, it's just an elf full of machine code, I know exactly what's in it. So the, you have to start right here with the building blocks to really actually be able to, to do this stuff. Uh, Wolfie, I call it, a, a, you know, it's a set of packages. You can call it a distro. It's not an OS, right? So it's made for container images. You know, think of an OS like a Red Hat. You've got packages for, you know, any software you might think to install, um, including kernels and bootloaders and systemd. Wolfie does not have package. Wolfie has packages for lots of things, but not the basics, not kernels and not bootloaders, because it's never meant to be installed on a machine, right? It's not an OS. It's a set of packages for a um, uh, for container images. So you can't go install this on like a, on a box and boot it. Just an aside, some of these things in these base images are, are kind of fast changing. So you might think of a base image as 
uh, you know, something that doesn't change very often. And, and this is something I see quite a lot is, you know, folks will have this nice CI/CD system and they'll go and build an image for one of their services, one of their microservices that, you know, doesn't get a lot of love. Um, you know, maybe the team's moved on and it's this thing, it just works, it just does its thing. But you, that container image can still be in use six, 12 months later because if the app hasn't changed, often nothing in the CI pipeline is gonna trigger a rebuild of the thing. But you've got base images that are now 12 months old. And there's a lot of things in that base image that that base image probably changes every day. And there's a lot of, there's reasons for that. And it's not actually maybe your libc, it's silly things like, well, CA certs that we'll come on to, but time zone data, right? Uh, time zones, for political reasons, there was that country that moved, jumped across the date line recently for political reasons, right? Um, time zone data changes actually surprisingly often. Uh, CA search change all that often, and these are things we don't want to get uh, stale. And you might want to override your distribution's opinions. So like the broader these packages are, the more stuff we end up with that we don't necessarily need or want. So you know, time, in your time zone data package, you're going to have the time zone information for, for troll, right? There is a time zone called troll, troll time. Uh, it's the time zone of troll station in, Ar in Ar Ant Antarctica, uh, which is owned by Norway. And I think in the summer, it uses Norwegian time because it's part of Norway, but in the winter, they actually change to UTC because flying in and out of, of Antarctica is really difficult and dangerous in the winter. So they really want to make triply sure that everybody's talking about the same. It was something it was something to do with like ATC insisting that for safety, everybody was like, you were in the same time zone as you were handed off between air traffic zones or I, something like that. Anyway, troll time is, it exists and it's weird. And yeah, okay, it takes up a few bytes, right? The encoding format for these things is, is pretty good. But do you need it in your base image? I'm not saying you should go home and like remove this terrible security flaw of the you know, troll time definition from your base image, but just think about what's in these things. Uh, CA certs are the, are the obvious example. Um, I think I've got another slide that, that talks about those. Um, maybe I don't, maybe I'll talk about them now. Um, so, the CA, so what are the CA certs? You know, so I'm talking about the web, the web, the web routes, right? The set of uh, root certificates that your browser trusts when it browses the internet, uh, and that your OS trust so your your os also has a set of root certificates that things like the package manager will trust when they go to when your os fetches things from the internet like you know updates those are this and those are the set of, of uh root certs that are just available on disk for like any other software to use so these are the ones that curl will pick up your browser will come with its own set for various reasons but things like curl and wget will just pick up the ca certs that are on the disk there is no sort of canonical set of them there is no like authority. There's no one authority that that tries to keep a set, and it's it's kind of easy to get to. I could I could go make a I could go self sign a cert now, right, and say, well, this is a root cert. And if I could persuade an OS to include it in their package, then everybody's machine would start trusting anything I sign with that root. Now I couldn't go and do it; they wouldn't listen to me. But every now and again, there's always one that's just been proved to be sort of owned by by an APT. Right, by a nation state actor or by a crime group or something. So these, there's more CA certs. You think, oh, what have I got? I've got the CA cert from VeriSign and from RSA and from that other one. Oh, does Cloudflare have their own CA cert? But you'll actually, there's like, you've got like 130 or something. And they do come and go and they are a threat. So there's something, and they get block listed all the time. So they are something that you want to keep up to date because you want them to, to go as fast as they come. Um, so there's another couple of tools that I'll touch on later that can, that can help us with that. Oh, well, there we go. I'm touching on them now. Um, so kind of as, as an aside, uh, the Jetstack folks, if anybody used to use Cert Manager, those folks made this thing called Trust Manager that basically mounts, this is a very long slide, isn't it? These should be speaker notes. That basically mounts certs at runtime because there's not everything you can trust. Not everything can be fixed uh, by building your own base images and, and keeping them up to date. You know, how slimly are we going to have a package for every single CA cert? You know, how thinly can we really slice that? So Trust Manager says, don't include CA certs in your base image, just uh, mount them at runtime. And then the Trust Manager daemon is the thing. It takes a CRD that literally says, right, these are the certs that I trust. These are the ones I want in all of my images. Um, so you can give it a fairly standard list of the web runs, like web ones, like VeriSign and RSA. And if you've got a corporate CA cert, you can include it in that as well, and it'll get mounted in. For anybody who's ever had to deal with a corporation with a firewall with its own CA cert, 
you have to copy it into every, you can't use base images off the internet, right? Because you have to rebuild everything. You have to take everything and copy your cert in, and then they end up out of date. So Trust Manager just completely ignore, uh, sidesteps that problem by just mounting the things in, and then you can declare with CRDs which ones you want. And they've got this little helper tool called Paranoia, which actually ser searches all the places that CA certs live um, in images, and will just will just deny the image if, if there are any in there. So you assert that there are no CA certs in your in your image, um, or at least you go find where they are, and then you just mount over the top of them with with Trust Manager. So the Wolfie packages are not as small as a package for each individual CA cert, because that would be kind of unmanageable, but there is a separate package for the CA certs, right? It's not part of some base. So you can build yourself with Wolfie and APKO, you can build yourself a base image that maybe has a libc, but doesn't have CA certs, right? So we've got that kind of fine-grained control, so we can then come along and use tools like this. Okay, so I'm gonna, I've got this APKO thing, I've got this wonderful Wolfie repo of... Um, you know, small images so I can be quite deliberate about what I want. Uh, small packages, sorry, so I can be quite deliberate about what I want. They're all signed, they've all got S bombs. The last piece of the puzzle is my own software, right? So normally I would have the base image and then I would like, you know, uh, copy dash dash from in my Docker file, like copy into it. But we're trying to be declarative now. So what I need is also an APK for my own software, right? If, we're, if I'm making declarative images with APKs, this is how my own software gets in. Uh, is that I make an APK for it and it just becomes one of the packages. Um, so enter the second tool, which is called Melange. Melange, Melange is more fun, sounds like a food. Um, so Melange is gonna make an APK for, you know, for my app. And when it does it, like it, it's gonna add an SBOM for all of the dependencies. Uh, you know, it understands the language I'm building. And this is what KO and JIB and things can do for specific languages. Melange tries to be language agnostic. Um, and it can add an S bomb, and then it can uh, it'll it'll add a signature as well. It'll, it'll insist actually that you sign the APK that you're building, and then we can take that APK along with all the other system ones that I've talked about, and we can we can make our declarative container image. I think that's probably enough talking. I think I will try to demo it. Like I said, it didn't work, but I can show you the YAML files at least. So the magic of TMUGs. Can everybody read that? Or is that still a little small? Can we, uh, hands up if you can't read it. Yeah, okay, good. Cool. So I've got, did I not have this somewhere else? No. Um, I've got a little uh, utility here called HTTP log. It's just some code I had lying around. I kind of needed it. Like it's a daemon, it listens on whatever port and you make an HTTP connection to it and it logs it. It sounds really stupid, but how often have you tried to, have you got like a, I, I had a load balancer that was trying to health check me and I just, it, I just didn't know what it was sending. I didn't know which host it was asking for. I didn't know what, like, which SNI server name it wanted or which um, Cypher suites it was trying to accept or anything. And all I knew was this old app that I had was just rejecting it. I just needed to get in the middle. Um, so you, I like ran an Nginx and then tried to fiddle with, but Nginx is huge. And then you try to like change Nginx log format to include all of this information. So I just wrote this thing. Anyway, it's like a few lines of Go and it just dumps like incoming connection. It just like dumps all the parameters and drops it. Anyway, it's some code I had lying around. It's, it's written in Go. It's fairly simple. It's not got that many dependencies. So I, and it was built with a Docker file. I think it's still here. Yeah, all right. Classic Docker file from Golang. Preload the cache, build it, you know, copy, copy the source in, build it, take, uh, whatever distro list we think we need, um, you know, copy it in, right? Very standard best practices stuff. Pass an interview with that. Um, I was asked to do that interview once. Uh, but I have the new tooling as well. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a signing key. So the first thing we're going to do is build our software into an APK uh, and Melange insists that we sign in. So the first thing we're going to do um, so I think the demo is going to work. And the way the demo is going to work is I, I can't, Melange on my system is of the latest version, it's broken. Most of this is running Melange from a container image that uh, ChainGuard publish, because whatever version that is, latest, you should never use latest, whatever version that is seems to work. So almost all of this is just like mounting volumes in the right place, we can do its thing. So this says Melange keygen, except I'm running it from a Docker image. Uh, 
So that generates uh, key pair of the right format that I can sign my own software with. I, I, you could probably just use OpenSSL for this, but you know they have a nice wrapper. Okay, so I now have uh, a public-private key pair that I'm going to sign my own software with. Okay, so now I'm going to use Melange to compile my software into an APK again. This is like more exciting when it doesn't take three minutes to write out what we're going to do. Okay, build, so melange, build. Um, I'm not going to cross-compile because it's quite slow. Um, so build for, for this ARM architecture. Uh, signing with the private half of that key, so actually signing sign the software we build. I'm going to point it at melange.yaml. And maybe we should have shown you the YAML first. So what it's doing is it's building it in a sealed, like Bazel, it's, it's building my software in a sealed hermetic environment. So the first thing it's doing is actually down, so this is your build time image, right? This is the first half of your Docker file. So I've told it which packages I need installed in order to build my thing. So again, it's using APK and it's, it's making an ephemeral, a temporary container image that contains GCC, bash, yeah, bin utils and go, right? So it's installing all of this into a, into a temporary image. It's then going to actually go is huge, but when it's when it's installed Go, it's going to go build my software. And there we go, libcrypto. How many problems have there been with that? Right, so it's now building my Go. So this is now downloading all this. So think about dependencies. Even at build time, I've got a bunch of system packages like bin utils. I have those Go lang packages, Go dependencies that we built. Um, it's complaining a little bit because I insisted on a statically linked output. Um, but here we go, we're done. Uh, we've got an AP so we've got an APK and a tarball somewhere. It's been signed with the private half of my key, uh, and somewhere up there it says that it made a it made an S bomb as well. So let me actually show you. So what I said is this is what my software is called. This is what version it's on. This is what it does. Um, when you build it, your build environment is. The, the packages for the build environment are going to come from, because again, I'm not used to using the Golang builder image, I'm making one. So the build environment is uh, from the Wolfie repo. I'm going to need the base layout. I'm going to need the kind of build tools like GCC and, and bin, uh, bin utils. I'm going to, and I'm going to need the Go tool chain. And by the way, when you download those packages, you should check their signatures and make sure we're not building with compromised software, right? That's going to do a malicious injection. And then this is how you build the software. And it's real simple. I just You just give it shell. So this can be any language you want. You can do anything you want here. But um, the important thing is it, it gives you this variable. So you just, um, whatever, you, whatever you output, you output into this targets.default, uh, targets.dester directory. So I'm just telling Go to like output into there. So you can do whatever arbitrary stuff you want. You just end up, I, I probably should have just built it locally and then copied it to make it easier. But we just copy into... Uh, targets.dester, and then that gets in, in whatever this you know hermetic environment is, and then that just sucks up the uh, whatever you know the tool sucks up whatever is in there, and puts it into an APK. Okay, so next I'm actually going to show you. So we've now got it's down here a package an APK for my software. So we're now going to build a container image declaratively from a bunch of APKs using APKO. So again, here's how to trust Wolfie packages. Here's how to get the packages that we're going to need to build this thing. So there's, we're going to look in the Wolfie repo. So we're going to look in the Wolfie OS repo. Uh, and this is the key ring for it. This is how you trust it. We're also going to look on the disk because this, so this is going to contain n minus one packages. And then this work packages is going to contain my package for HTTP log, right? So it's, it's that simple. Those are the repositories. And then the packages I want are, again, the, so this is for the runtime container. So this is our kind of custom distro list. So what I want is the base, the base layout, the really simple stuff like a you know, temp directory and a password file, the CA cert bundle. I could remove this and use Trust Manager instead, but I'm, I'm keeping it simple. I want, I want the CA certs that Wolfie provides, right? And you'd have to, if you really care about your security, you'd have to go talk to them about what set up you know, what their criteria are for including these, these certs. And then my own package, HTTP log, which I know is going to come from you know, work packages. And I've got the signing key for the Wolfie stuff. 
and I will add, I'm going to add uh, as a command line argument, I add the signing key because remember we signed our APK when we made it. I'm going to add the signing key for that as like an append. And then by the way, this container image, you know, I want to, I'm going to make a non root user. And, and this is the entry point. So, you know, fairly standard Docker file stuff. So, gump. But essentially, APKO build uh, append to the key ring, the, the public part of the signing key. So, we saw that there was in the YAML said how to verify all the packages out of the, the Wolfie repo. I'm adding this public key to, to verify my package, even though it's locally on disk. You still you should keep those sort of uh, the signature integrity all the way through. I'm only going to build it for ARM because I can't be bothered waiting. Uh, and then there's the YAML that you just saw, and this is the tag that we're going to put on it. This is the um, the tag we're going to put on the on the image. Uh, and it's pretty much that quick. So I've now got. This doesn't load it, this isn't nice. So this, the Docker tooling is really nice. Uh, and the Docker, which you say Docker build, it actually builds and then also loads into your do local Docker daemon so you can run it straight away. This has literally just built the image and it's given me a tarball on disk. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna do is, yeah, Docker load it, right? Just suck it into the local registry so I can actually run it. Oh, but that doesn't work. I told you it was broken. Oh, uh, okay, so I'm just in the wrong directory. Docker load. This is what happens if you try to fix things three minutes before you come on stage. It's up there, there we go, okay. So it's got this public, uh, Docker, if you've not been into the depths of Docker, it's uh, like, this might be a bit confusing, but it's got this public tag on it, but it's actually not in that place yet, it's, it's local. But anyway, my Docker daemon, if I tell it to run this, it's not gonna go fetch anything, it's just gonna, it's just gonna run it. And I can actually do that. Right, so we didn't fetch anything, and then this thing's saying, uh, hey, I'm listening. And I've actually got a slightly longer command. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna run it, but I'm gonna forward the port and I'm gonna give this thing a few uh, a few arguments. So this actually puts it into like a proxy mode. So what it's really what it returns is not like it normally just says, Hi, I logged your thing. Um, it's now actually gonna just proxy to, to Google, but it's gonna log everything in the middle. Because that lets us. Okay, so Google, this is a Google response. Like you can see Google. Uh, it's just said for I haven't put the right path on it. So it's like, go away. But um, my logging thing, there we go. We've accepted like the incoming TCP connection. I asked for localhost 8080 with HTTP 1. This was my user agent. And then I've proxied to that and I've, I've returned it. Okay, so the, it, so the thing, the, the software works. Um, if we get time and if it works, I'll show what we do if we don't have CA certs in the base image. That's the reason I put it in proxy mode, is this thing's going to accept my connection. It's going to try to call out to HTTPS google.com, and then it's going to, it's going to refuse that connection. Like it, this thing will refuse to connect because it can't trust google.com because it has none of the trust routes. Um, so that's the kind of spoiler. That's why the, the demo is a little bit convoluted. But anyway, we built an image. We ran it locally. It works. The a couple of the next steps. So I just want to show what, so this image is obviously built, it obviously works. It was hopefully very quick to build. It's got all those properties I've talked about. I won't go over them again. I'm actually just going to push it up to a, a real repo on the internet because some of the, I'm just going to show uh, a couple of the, the things we can do with this now and a couple of these tools require it to, to be, they can't read my local Docker team and they need to be on it, need it on the, in, the, the internet. Um, right, so anybody who's looked at any of this stuff before, <laughs> having a certificate and having an S bomb is great, but you've got to actually package them with your container image somehow. Container images are, there are multiple standards because of course there are. Some of the newer ones have fields that will take a signature and will take an S bomb, right? So in some of the newer container image formats, uh, like OCI v2, uh, an S-bomb is a first-class thing. It's a piece of metadata like the name and you know and the, like the entry point. Uh, in some of the older ones or some in some of the older registries that don't support this, you 
you can't do that. You don't want this SBOM like in the actual image, in the tarball. You want it as metadata. You want it separate, but you want it like with the thing. So if the image format itself, the image is like metadata format, doesn't support it, the hack is that the SBOM is uploaded like alongside. So it what it does is it makes a separate tag. Remember, you know, I tagged this thing with like version 0.7.11 or whatever it was. It's also just going to give it a big old, and it's going to write another tag Another, literally another image in the registry alongside, and the tag is this big old SHA-256.sbomb. Uh, and the, this, is a, this is a hack, but a lot of the tools know how, to, know how to go find these things like alongside. So this is the SHA of the image. So if I say download uh, 0.7.11, it'll download the thing, it'll SHA it, and be like, oh, I wonder if there's a you know, foo.sbomb. Um, so yeah, this is what's going on here. This, so this stuff is quite new. The, you know, the tooling is evolving, container registry is evolving. Um, image formats are evolving, but it's up there. And I can now just really simply show you Docker SBOM, new command. So this, the Docker client, weirdly doesn't read from the local registry, insists on reading from the, um, from the internet, which is why I had to push it. Mm. Okay, and it. We're running out of time. Running out of time. I, I'm nearly done. Cool. How much time have I run out of? Oh, I'm done, aren't I? Okay, cool. So it, yeah, it downloaded it because, of course, it did. Um, you know, it parsed it and it did whatever. And here is the list of stuff. And this is verified and this is untampered. Uh, this is attested because it's signed. So what's in this image? Well, there's OS packages. So there's Wolfie base layout, you know, temp directory and whatever. There's the OS package for the CA certs. So this is, in this case, this is what I wanted. This is what Paranoia would warn you about because you probably want to mount them at runtime so they don't get out of date. Um, there's a glibc. There shouldn't be, because I deliberately statically linked my Golang so that I didn't have to have a glibc, because I wanted to remove this attack surface. I'll have a look at this demo later. Uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's a glibc, but that's an APK package, right? That's an OS package. And then there's one more OS package. There's one more APK, which is my software, which, by the way, contains, it's a binary blob. Like I open it with Vim. I just get a screen of non-printing characters. But because we've got SBOMs all the way down, I can tell you there's a bunch of Go modules in there. So I can tell you there's you know, a, a TTY detector. That's how we get the colored output. There's a job parser. There's a logger. You know, it doesn't have a lot of dependencies, but it's, but it's got those. Uh, it even shows me the dependencies on the, uh, they're not quite standard library, on the sort of extended standard library. You think of this as like Spring or something. So, so yeah, uh, I've run out of time. Okay. The rest of the demo was was me saying, okay, I'm happy with this because I've got signed Wolfie APKs in it. I've got my own signed software. I'm I can say I'm happy with the SBOM signed the whole thing. You know, say that I know the CI system that built it, you know, hadn't tripped any antivirus alarms recently. This is the correct SBOM that I was expecting, and I actually would go fix this first, right? And then the next thing of the demo is signing it. Uh, we can attach a signature to it, and we publish it to a, a global, to a, a blockchain, essentially, to a global transparency log. So that can never be refuted, right? This, the shah of this image, uh, and its public signature will always, forever, be associated in a global way that anybody can read and attest. There's this thing called recall, which is like a global uh, certificate transparency log, so that those can't be refuted because you've got to solve the zeroth turtle, right? And recall is like a trusted third party for that particular zeroth turtle. This guy's getting really agitated. We're done.